Wonderful. I think we have uh, folks online. So good morning if you're in the US, good afternoon in Europe, and good evening if you're dialing in from Asia, India, anywhere around the world. Uh, and welcome to uh, hopefully a really nice hour of conversation um, with none other than Thierry de la uh, who's the CEO of Wipro. There's not, not a lot of introduction there. Um, I'm Phil First, the founder and CEO of HFS Research. And uh, as we go through our dialogue, uh, please, you know, feel free to send some Q and A's, and we'll try and uh, answer some of them today, if not later. Um, and we'll also make a recording of this available uh, for those of you who aren't able to listen to all of it. Um, uh, so I think if I need to tell you how to use Zoom at this point, where have you been for the last year? So go into the Q and A box and send in your questions if you'd like to get some answers and, and we'll get started. But uh, Terry, great to have you on here. Um, but maybe before we begin, it'd be lovely to hear a bit more about your background, where you came from. And I, I know you've lived and worked in many countries around the world as well. So but it'd be great to sort of hear a bit about, about you and, uh, and how you got to where you are today. Oof. It's going to be a long, a long discussion, Phil. Uh, so first of all, no, uh, thank, Phil, thanks for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to join uh, you and uh, everyone uh, today. Uh, so who I am, um, you know, I've tried to hide it for 25 years, but yet every time I start to speak, people go, oh, he must be French. So yes, I am French. Uh, and uh, I will remain French. I have one of these French person who has spent most of his life abroad, many different countries, lived in Asia, lived in Europe, lived in America. And actually, I'm not even sure if you ask me where I live, uh, what to tell you. I think I am one foot in New York, one in Paris. But these days, it doesn't matter anyway, right? Um, Phil, uh, I am a learner. I am someone who uh, try to learn every day and progress in everything I do. I have studied in law and political science. I have then moved, started my career as an external auditor. So running financial reviews and accounting reviews and so on. Then uh, became a finance executive in uh, an, uh, my previous company and then grew as a salesperson. And I think I was the first finance person becoming a head of sales of a large operations, right. then run the operations and then became a global leader and then became the chief operating officer of this organization and then moved to another organization, a fantastic company we brought. Uh, where I operate and I've been uh, leading uh, this organization for the last one year. What it means, I'm constantly uh, learning, I try to uh, play on my strengths, work on my weaknesses, and um, try to surround myself with the best talent I can find. Uh, that's, that's, that's who I am. Like, other than that, Phil, uh, lovely wife, uh, 28 years, uh, married a 28 years, four kids, uh, 27 down to 19. I'm a very uh, pleased and lucky uh, husband and, and dad. This is who I am. And, <laughs> and the last thing you need to know is, um, you know, my passion for sports and sports is driving a lot of my uh, philosophical thinking in business because I think I'm learning a lot from sport every day in the way to accept losing sometimes and in the way to bounce back and believe that, you know, we can always get better at, at you know, what we are doing. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's one big driver. Final, final, final for me is I have another passion, uh, which is uh, a nonprofit created 11 years ago with a brother, uh, one of my uh, numerous brothers, and uh, that is uh, uh, looking after the young adults suffering from extreme exclusion around the world. I don't have much time for the uh, NGO at the moment, as you can imagine, but uh, it still has a part of my heart, definitely. 
And as the uh, world around you opens up, which of your sports are you going to play the first? Which, where are you going to go back to? India. Of course, <laughs> India. <laughs> Phil, I have for... So I joined Wipro on July 6th. And now we are June 1st or 2nd. It's been a mo uh, 11 months where I've been expecting the day I will be able to travel to India, walk into the campuses of Wipro and start to meet physically this time uh, our co my colleagues. And that will be at the same time, extremely exciting and incredibly emotional uh, because it will mean a lot for me, but it will mean a lot also for uh, the company and you, you know, feel how tough is the situation in India these days. Yes. I am, um, at the same time, I, I am absolutely 100% with the people in India and the teams that are really fighting this virus, but also supporting people around them, supporting teams, supporting clients, while trying to stay healthy and safe. But I feel sometimes that distance is uh, too far and I would love to be uh, among them. So. Definitely my first trip will be for India and several cities in India. Yes, I mean, I, I've commented to my colleagues many times over the last year plus, the, the one trips I miss the most are the trips to India because everyone makes us feel so welcome and they're so excited uh, to host us. So uh, I can only imagine how emotional that will be uh, when you can make that, make that trip. Um, do you think... Um, do you think uh, India will emerge differently as they recover from this, this situation? Certainly. Uh, if I observe for many reasons, okay, so you can look at the, you know, uh, from a medical standpoint, there's a lot to be done from a political standpoint, from a uh, economical standpoint, the whole country will have been impacted dramatically uh, by uh, the virus and in particular over the last uh, eight weeks, right? The rise we have seen of cases and the number of people dying and the, the way, uh, you know, the crisis has been handling. I'm not commenting from a political standpoint. I think nothing is easy, but certainly from a human standpoint, I think it's been extremely demanding, extremely exhausting emotionally for, for everyone. Uh, at the same time, Phil, I am amazed, absolutely amazed by the resilience and the tenacity, the bravery of uh, the people uh, uh, in India facing this situation. Um, just, I, you know, I cannot speak for the whole country, but, you know, as you know, uh, Wipro has over 145,000 employees in, in India. So uh, we have, every single of our teams have been impacted, right? We have had teams where up to 20, 25% uh, of the um, uh, colleagues would be affected uh, personally or, or not directly, but still affected at the same time. And so that has been really extremely uh, tough on them. Uh, and at the same time, the way they maintain the focus on their responsibility in front of the clients, the way they have um, pushed the barriers of the, of, of the possible to support colleagues, the way, you know, from a logistic standpoint, from a, you know, financial standpoint, from an administrative standpoint, unbelievable. And so I think, you know, at the same time, I would say there must be a lot of big learnings from events like that, that are overwhelmingly challenging for a country. But also, I think from a human standpoint, a lot of outstanding things to take out of this uh, history. I am, I am again, proud, very proud to see how the people have been stepping up uh, with, you know, with incredible courage uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the crisis. I, I am a 
absolute optimist person and I tend to believe that the worst is behind. I hope I'm right. Predictions have been difficult uh, to do over the last 11 months, but I hope that things will settle uh, soon. Okay. Thank you for that, Terry. Uh, that's very impassioned. Um, so you've made a lot of uh, changes uh, over the course of the, the nearly a year since you've been with Wipro uh, in, in the talent and, and the team you're building, the leadership team. Um, what is the vision behind uh, what you're doing and, and the team that you're building? Um, the, the vision, the vision that, you know, I have for Wipro is we are a, one of the leader in our industry uh, uh, with incredible talent, about 200,000 people that have grown in technology and that have invested into technology. They love it. They, they love technology. They work for some of the, you know, the largest account, the largest clients uh, on earth uh, for many years. A lot of our relationship are going back many, many years. There's a lot of history in these relations. Uh, and if I look at, you know, Wipro, Wipro is unique by its culture, its values. The, the, the fact that, you know, Wipro is an organization, it's a company where 67% of the profit go to the foundation as in Premji. This is 67% of the profit of the company generated every year go to philanthropic activities. It means that the sense of purpose is in this organization is completely unique. People are very aware of that and they really, there is a part of everyone's brain that says that, you know, when we are improving our performance, we will contribute to a better world. And, you know, that's a huge driver in everyday's life. Now, People at Wipro have huge hearts. They love, they bleed Wipro. They have been, you know, they, they, you're a Wiproite and you are a Wiproite forever. So amazing values, very strong culture inside the organization, passion for technology, very strong clients. What's the vision? Unleash this potential, be closer to the customer understand their business challenges, right? So listen to them and understand what is driving their priorities and be the one on their side who will leveraging technology, bring ideas, disruptive at times, challenging the status quo to improve the performance of the organization, to create new stream of revenue, to be more agile as an organization. So the vision is, it starts with the ambition to really be this partner. Be this partner, I, I, I insist on that. We obviously understand technology, but we understand the business of our clients. And technology matters as long as it is addressing business challenges. And so that's the combination of the two that makes us strong. Now, you know, the vision is to create the environment, create the context for the organization to be, to have the biggest impact with our customer. So how do we have a bigger impact? How are we more relevant with our uh, clients? They trust us, they know us, they understand our strengths and weaknesses. How can we bring more that, that you know, we help them drive their own transformation, leveraging our expertise, our knowledge of similar situations with our, with our customers. That's really, that, has, that is what has driven my uh, actions and the actions of the team over the, the, the last 11, 11 months, Phil. Right. Um, and in terms of the qualities and skill sets that you're looking for today, do you feel they're different even from before pandemic days in terms of what you're looking for in your leaders and in your middle managers, for example? 
I mean, yes, for one reason. Yes to yes, different from uh, previous pandemic, uh, post pre-pandemic, if you like, because what? The pandemic has accelerated the evolution of our market, of our industry. And we see that every, every day. I am meeting four to five clients every single day for the last 11 months. I have met over 300 clients. And I, you know, I, as I said, you know, I keep listening to them, learning from them so that I can reflect and adjust uh, uh, the evolution of our um, progression. Every single client, whatever the industry, is aware that he needs to accelerate its transformation to stay relevant. And that is completely uh, 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 unique. I don't think we've had a moment in time in the past where all the industries were impacted by technology in a way, by the evolution of technology through different drivers, of course, but at the same time. So every organization has the understanding that transformation is a must. Transformation is a big word, but what we are saying is be ready to change. Be ready to adapt to the evolution of the world you live in and your client live in. So those industries are going through this journey. The pandemic has actually dramatically accelerated the realization of the necessity for the companies to accelerate this journey. Uh, you know, from one day to another, and no one would have thought it would have been possible, but, you know, from one day to another, we've had to get to really shift, uh, you know, the investment to how do we, how can we operate in a world that is, you know, partially virtual, right? Yeah. How do we make sure that, you know, while we have people that are working from you know, different places, uh, the company can continue to operate, continue to connect with clients, continue to create new streams of revenue and so on. So yes, Phil, this, um, uh, the pandemic of the last 11 months has triggered an acceleration of a rotation of an evolution that had started already some years ago which basically means that, you know, we've also had to adjust to it and accelerate also the investment into the capabilities, the skills, the talent that support those new technologies, right? You know, technology, you know, the, the best example to me, I don't, know, I don't know if you want me to go into the specifics now, but just take an example. The best example is cloud. Phil, a year or two ago, I would still have discussion with clients telling me, I don't know, you know, cloud is a big hype, you know, you know, I, it, it has some, uh, cons I have some concerns around the cloud, what about data protection, what about sovereignty, and so on and so on. So, you know, I'm not sure about the strategy we're going to apply in our organization, and we need to reflect on that. I, I, I haven't seen a client telling me not having a clear, I mean, not having the not having decided to move on the cloud uh, for a long time. Now it's very clear, every company needs to move because if you're not driving your cloud transformation, you will never have the agility uh, that will allow you to adapt to the evolution of technology in the future. You know, I was trying to explain to um, a friend of mine the consequence of not driving transformation to the cloud by saying if you stay with the old iPhone version three or one, one or two or three, whatever, you probably can't, uh, you know, you, you will not be able to download most of the applications that have been built and created over the last years. And that's the cloud will allow you to actually create the environment for the development of those new platforms and solutions and and, and, and environment in the future. And that is clear, but I think the level of adoption or understanding of the necessity to accelerate over the last months has changed dramatically. Yeah, and, and how's that changed the role of service providers? Because 
the increasing power of like on the digital juggernauts like Apple, Google, Amazon. Um, doesn't that put someone like Wipro in the position where you're the face to the to the ecosystem that's evolving to clients? Is that is it really changing the role of the service provider in your opinion? Um, maybe it does. I think it always, you know, everything impacts everything. So it's probably changing a little bit the role. In my view, back to the first question you had, um, we are in the world where technology is everywhere. It's not only, you know, the IT department, the back office that is investing into technology, every single business, you know, every single department in every single industry is leveraging technology. And so, you know, technology is a must. Companies are investing in technology, but the, the trick is that technology drives complexity. How are you going to connect all those pieces of technology? How are you going to deal with scalability of technology? How are you gonna build, deal with security issues? How are you going to deal with, you know, regulations and compliance issues and so on. And so I think, you know, obviously our clients are working with the Apple, Microsoft and Amazon of this world or Google, they do, and more and more. But they also work with startups, fintechs, insurtech, you know, all sorts of smaller companies. And so there's a huge ecosystem of companies that are providing products and, and, and solutions. Our role, I see our role as a role of orchestrator. That's why I believe we need to be as close as possible to our clients because we need to understand their environment to help them simplify. The big theme I believe for companies is certainly to drive agility, but at the end of the day, why agility? Because simplifications drive efficiency. And you know, in the level of complexity that you know, all those additions of products uh, uh, can leave you with, you need someone on your side who is going to help you driving, you know, consistency, orchestrate all those different assets and get the best out of it. I want to mention that the relationship of a, the relation of a company like Wipro with those large companies like Apple, Google, Fa Facebook, uh, uh, Microsoft, Amazon has never been as strong. Yesterday, I will not main, name him, but I was talking to one of the leaders of these companies on a deal. And I think we have a lot more engagement with these companies now that we had 10 years ago. They need us as much as we need them. We are different worlds. They are developing uh, products. They need people, companies like us, creating the environment for them to continue to scale up and develop applications and solutions on these large platforms and, and on this, you know, in this environment. So I would say, um, I remember probably four, five, six years ago, people are wondering whether, you know, the adoption of the cloud would be uh, uh, impacting negatively the, the gross potential of IT services provider. I'm actually, actually convinced more than ever that it's absolutely not the, the case. It's the opposite. Because the more we create the, the environment of agility and you know, the more we see the potential of technology to transform the companies. And so you know, we, we, that's where we have a unique position. Yeah, and coming off this experience with faster moving decisions and this increased desire, speed to move into the cloud, how, how does that change you as a services firm in terms of um, getting the talent you need to get close to your clients' clients? So clearly, you've made acquisitions like Capco, which are experienced consultants in particular industries like BFS. Um, but how do you look at your own teams and think, how can you maybe uh, retrain, uh, uh, bring new capabilities into your, into your own house? How, how are you viewing that in this, in this environment? 
couple of couple of things. Uh, one, it's you know clearly set the ambition and define you know our positioning as you know our ambition is not to be a uh, service provider, you know, providing services, but truly be the partner. I think obviously our client expect from us flawless execution on services. So if we have a contract and we have to deliver and it has to be impeccable, I think it speaks for ourselves more than anything else. You know, you do not have a seat at the table if you are not able to deliver, you know, flawlessly. Uh, 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 you know, the services that are expected by the clients, but the client expect more. They uh, actually expect you to come with ideas, you to come with, uh, you know, uh, be, be more proactive, if you like, and really uh, engage with them at a strategic level and ideate and project ideas of how the company can, you know, progress along the line of productivity improvement or you know gross gross potential but once you have ideated and developed those ideas how do we do you turn them into you know how do you design really the roadmap how do you design the 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 the, the business case how do you build your you know the strategy the plan and then can you execute that's the end to end relationship that i'm looking for I believe that Wipro is geared up, has the position, has the potential to really be this end-to-end -end play partner for our clients. Banking and insurance sector is our number one sector. We have very strong team, outstanding talent. Uh, and I felt that you know, the addition of Capco would bring a unique uh, position. Uh, to the uh, combination, if you like. Uh, it would really combine deep, deep, deep technology expertise with good uh, domain knowledge, with very big and strong domain expertise and nice technology uh, uh, um, um, capabilities. And also the ability to connect with different stakeholders, because that's the other thing, Phil. Today, to be closer to your client, to understand the client and understand the client of the client, you need to connect with many stakeholders. Uh, obviously, uh, with you know, the, the, the team who's in charge of technology development or technology uh, in, uh, investment uh, in the organization, but you also need to connect with the business. You need to gaze, engage with you know, the chief growth officer or chief marketing officer, you need to engage with the CFO and the head of HR, with the head of operations, with the head of manufacturing. You need to engage with them at multiple level because um, they need technology. And, and that's you know, where we are uniquely positioned. So that's in terms of strategy. Second, it's in terms of capabilities. You need to have different families of capabilities, Phil. You have people, you know, IT engineers, architects, consultants. You need to have domain people. You know, if you are, if you want to work in the automotive sector, you must have experts of this industry who understand what are the, the key points, the keeping points uh, of the industry at the moment, right? If we cannot have a discussion with our client around electrification, autonomous vehicle, and so on. You know, this is, this is limiting. And so the knowledge of domain, uh, the domain knowledge is critical. And, you know, we are driving at the moment in Wipro truly a, um, uh, we are, there's a huge focus on talent development, on talent acquisition as well, and diversity of talent. Because, you know, we strongly believe that, you know, we will be stronger and more relevant for the client when we are pushing diversity of talent. So by the way, I mentioned diversity in terms of background, in terms of profile. I also mean in terms of culture and in terms of gender, right? So push logic of diversity across the organization because the more diverse we are, the more global we are, the more global we are, the more our client will understand us. And so the intimacy we want to build with them require this diversity. 
The third is probably from ourselves is in terms of organization. How do we make sure that clients are at the center of our organization? You know, it's always nice to say that, you know, uh, sorry, my daughter calling. Um, so, you know, it's always nice to say, um, client is at the center of the organization. But what does it mean? What does it mean? How do you make sure that this is really the case? Here's what we've done at Wipro over the last uh, 11 months. We have re reviewed our organization model to make sure that we would reduce the need to spend time internally, simplify the organization to the extreme with logic, simplicity over perfection. The more you want to have the organization right, the more you drive complexity. However, complexity is driving inefficiency, is driving uh, uh, slowness and lack of decision and you know, basically disconnect from the market and from our clients. So simplicity, meaning less PL than ever, we had 27 PLs rolling up to me. Today I have four PLs. Right. So it's a lot less people in our industry know it. Every single PL is a potential silo. And the silo is not a problem so much for the organization, it's a, it's a problem for the client because the client wants to get the best of Wipro and he doesn't want to know whether the resource or the person or the talent is coming from team A or team B. He wants the best from Wipro. And so the less silo, the more you can have one we brought. You can have one company supporting it. Yeah, yeah. So simplifying the organization is a must. Yeah, and uh, your organization around uh, geographies in particular, is that very much looking at this intimacy in mind and simplicity? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing we've done also is we've said, okay, to manage the relationship with an account, with a client, we, need, we have one person, an account executive, right? How can we empower more this account executive? How can we make sure that this person managing the relationship with the, with the client is the most important, the most powerful person of the organization? I'm saying to the leadership team of Wipro, they, every one of them, every one of us, including myself, we are here to serve the account executives so that they have the biggest impact and they are the most relevant for the clients. So one, reducing tremendously, reducing the number of layers between an account executives and the uh, most senior person in the organization. We've reduced the layers by two layers. You know, it may, again, not seem huge, but it's huge because, you know, it means that, you know, for an account executive to reach out to me when there is a need on an account, it's very simple, it's straightforward, he does it. And that's why I'm interacting with client every day. He doesn't have to go through a series of, you know, checkpoints and, you know, hierarchical reviews and so on. So speed is here. Second, he has more power. So he can make decisions for Wipro with the client, in front of the client in terms of you know, what we can do, what we should do, what we cannot do. It, it can also obviously influence the talent and make sure that we get the right talent on the team and so on. So we've reinforced the power of the account executives. We've hired tall account executives and we have restructured our organization around those accounts so that at the end of the day, you know, we are making sure that the clients get access to all the resources, assets, solutions, capabilities, innovation that exists in the organization. Right. So as we emerge from this pandemic, it's becoming very clear that the infrastructure in many countries is fairly brittle. I mean, you can just look at the colonial pipeline ransomware attack in the US and some of the attacks that have happened on enterprises. Um, and, you know, do you think we're getting overly obsessed with maybe the future when we, we should be focused a bit more on the banality of the present? 
And is that something that you're really looking at at this point? Um, it's a complex question. So I would say, uh, yes, we have seen a significant uh, increase of the number of, uh, I mean, a certain level of anxiety arising from all industries' clients on uh, the uh, potential threats uh, on the security side. And I think it's a reality. And I think that it just, um, you know, it, it's it's the journey we are in. At the same time, you know, technology drives a lot more opportunities. And at the same time, it requires more and more security. And so I think it's the reality. And it's a matter of fact that, you know, companies cannot uh, leave um, the eye of, uh, security issues uh, in in companies. We are a lot of discussions and you know interventions with clients, uh, helping them you know refining their strategy, working on the remediations, or um, you know helping them addressing some of their uh, 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 issues. And I think it's a it's not gonna go down. Okay, Phil, as we are um, hopefully soon. Starting to talk about the post-pandemic period, I think you know it will just not go down. I think the uh, potential opportunities driven by you know 5G, by AI technology, by automation, by you know Internet of Things, you know the sensors, you know data everywhere, needs to be protected. And you know failing to um, pay enough attention to security will be very expensive for, for companies and not only for government, for companies, for every organization on earth. So this, there is no doubt that, you know, and, and, and we are um, seeing also, going back to the point we discussed early on with, you know, the relationship with the uh, large uh, uh, hyperscalers, right? Uh, what's interesting is that companies have been investing a lot in security products, but there is a huge need for security talent. Uh, and I see this demand now more than ever. And so we are investing, uh, we are uh, developing our capabilities, we are hiring, we are acquiring company, we just acquired a security company in Australia, and we'll continue to do so because, you know, this is uh, not something that, you know, it's actually going to continue to grow exponentially over the next uh, years. I'm absolutely convinced. Yeah, but yeah, it's, uh, it's dominating some conversations and we're focusing a lot of our research around cyber uh, because of this as well. Um, let's shift some gears to a little bit about maybe you and um, as you look over your your career and where you are today what would you who would you attribute to being your greatest influences in your life and 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 what perspectives have they given you you know that's always a difficult question <laughs> you know you would um uh you know I've got to say the first great influencer are my parents, right? My dad died when I was a kid. I was very young. So obviously influence was there, but, you know, uh, you know, he, 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 you know, um, uh, then I would say um, I've, because I'm a learner and because I trying to really get the best and learn the best from the people that are around me, I've with the people that I've been working with and really learning what they had to, uh, to offer, if you like, uh, and, and, and really benefiting from that. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I've joined WePro 11 months ago. I will never forget my first uh, meeting with uh, Azim Premji. I think it is such an immense personality that, you know, I think I, I'm influenced and I'm uh, driven by uh, the sense of responsibility and with humility, I tell you, um, to um, with, together with Richard, of course, uh, to really drive forward uh, the, uh, the legacy of this organization. But I am 
incredibly impressed by and in and I would say inspired by an entrepreneur who has built a global player, one of the best brand in the world, and yet one of the most generous, if not the most generous person on earth. And I have observed, it's not only reading books, I am blessed and lucky enough to observe it firsthand. I'm seeing the impact uh, of uh, Azim Premji and the foundation over the last 12 months through the pandemics. You know, and that's, you know, unique. I think it is inspiring me because I feel that this is a new path for the, you know, for the um, corporate world, for the capitalism, if you like, the, the, the conscious capitalism, really. Uh, it, it, it's extremely motivating and uh, energizing to work hard to improve performance, knowing that at the end of the day, the reason you're doing so, it's, you know, going to do good uh, elsewhere. And so that's my inspiration. Uh, among others, again, I have many inspiration, but it's a unique, incredible inspiration that I've been blessed to, to meet uh, a little more than a year ago. Yeah, no, I have a great chart. I'm going to dig it out so if I can ever find it. But, uh, Azim Premji has donated more than any other business leader to COVID relief and COVID research in the world. And that includes uh, Jack Dorsey and Warren Buffett. If you add them together, he's still personally uh, donated more money. And I, I, I was staggered at how, uh, uh, how much of his wealth that he, uh, he reinvests back into communities and into medical research and, and things like that. So uh, I'm delighted that you called that out and we could, we could talk about that. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple of, well, lots of questions <laughs> have been piling in from uh, our audience. Uh, there was a good one I thought I'd, I'd like to start with, which is, um, who is your favorite, you know, what is your favorite sport and who is your favorite sports person? Ah, <laughs> thank you for this question. Well, so I'm, I mean, the, the, the WePro team must be laughing listening to that, if they do. Uh, it's really, you know, I, I, I love soccer, okay? I love football, soccer, because I've, been 15 years in America, so I've learned how to spell football in, in America as well. Um, and I'm a, I will not surprise anybody, I'm a huge PSG fan, right? Um, so, and, and today, I mean, I must say the best player on earth is still Leo Messi. Uh, and I don't remember have, having seen ever a better player in my entire life before. But I'm very inspired by the young uh, Kylian Mbappe, uh, who, you know, incidentally is French, but happens to be probably the next best player on earth. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's inspiring mm -hmm. again to see uh, these young people of 21, 22 years of age who are already incredible players and still aspiring to get better every day. That's inspiring. Yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing you talk about your experiences as cricket at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next time, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So Mbappe, I, I would agree, he's a phenomenal, phenomenal talent. And he seems like a modest, humble man as well, which I like. Um, um, in terms of... Uh, um, you know, some of the questions we have here, um, how you're looking at the balance between India and the rest of the world as you look at building out your labor force and, 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 and growing the firm. Um, what, what is your strategy now in terms of uh, how, do, how do you want to balance things? As you see, uh, you've signed some very large contracts which require an immense amount of work and trust to get them to profitability and all that sort of thing. Um, what, what's your viewpoint on the global strategy now for, for balancing your, your, your locations and, 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 and how you get that balance right with the clients as, as you grow? Well, so Wipro is a global firm. We're a global player. We have our um, born in India, right? The culture of Wipro is, you know, coming from India. 
It's a reality, it's a fact, and we are very proud of that. And it will not change. But Wipro has grown so much, it's a global player. And as a global player, we want to be global. What does it mean? We'll go and hire the talent globally. Talent is global, Wipro is global. So this is how I look at it. Um, you know, very proud of who we are, very proud of our legacy, very proud of our roots. And we continue to grow looking at the sky and, you know, embracing the global uh, uh, dimension of our clients. Uh, what matters to our clients is that indeed we are global, but also they want a local, um, they want a local presence. When I say presence, it's not only having an office, it's understand their culture also. The same way we pros cultures and in heritage is in India, you know, our clients want us to understand their own culture. And so that's what, why it's so important to clearly develop not only strong global networks, but also a local presence. And that's what we are doing. It doesn't mean that in every location you must have one standard, one type of person. No, again, being global everywhere is great. I'm, I myself as a French, I've been outside of France most of my career. So, you know, I, I'm not the one to be convinced. And when I look at Wipro, I have a big obsession for us being every day more global. I think we have, you know, a very open culture. Um, again, if it wasn't the case, uh, Richard, the chairman, wouldn't have hired uh, a CEO coming from France. And so I think it was a very strong signal as well that, you know, citizenship, culture, whatever, doesn't matter. You know, we are global citizen. And that's really the whole philosophy, Phil, uh, for the development of, uh, of Wipro going forward. And um, a lot of questions around your views on emerging technologies, but maybe we'll sum it down to maybe what are the two emerging technologies that you think are going to have maximum impact in the next two to five years as you look at things like blockchain and quantum uh, becoming part of the conversation? You know, if you talk about impact in the next five years, I would say 5G. Absolutely, because it's going to drive a lot of acceleration of, you know, data. Uh, and therefore, you know, you know, allows, you know, to take faster decisions, you know, but also uh, it, it will allow to create, um, you know, more intelligent uh, industries, more intelligent enterprises. And so 5G for me will be a big driver of change uh, in the next years. I would also believe that from, from frankly, from AI standpoint, we have barely scratch the surface. I think, you know, every company is, you know, s s accumulating gazillion volume of data and don't know exactly how to leverage the data. I think technology will help us, you know, be more data centric, more data driven, better, you know, understand and, you know, get inside out of it. I think in terms of technology, the artificial intelligence is going to be uh, continue to drive a lot of big, big, big impact. Uh, quantum co computing also, of course, you know, because it's you know allowing uh, basically to uh, compute immense volume of data at incredible speed that normal computer can't handle, and I think it's you know the the future as well. So those industries will continue to grow, those uh, technology will continue to grow and um, you know, be leveraged more and more by the, by the industries. Yeah. And um, I didn't mention blockchain by the way, but I believe the same as well. Right, awesome. So um, if we put you on a desert island, Thierry, and I say you have uh, one book to take with you, you can read, one movie to watch, and one song you can listen to. 
<laughs> oh my god! Put you on the put you on the spot there. Yeah. All right. Yeah. This is. Uh, I wish I would be prepared for that. Uh, but uh, okay. Uh, you know, at least people will know that it's really, really life. Okay. And exactly. It's not prepared. Uh, you know, a book. Uh, I would need to have a book that I can uh, reflect on. Okay. So a book that I would never get bored with. And so I would suggest, but I, you know, I would myself would take the Bible because I think that I can probably read it 100,000 times and still find out things inside that, you know, would help me learn and progress. Uh, video, again, uh, people who know me know that, you know, I'm very bad at remembering uh, movies, uh, titles. And so I'm really struggling with this one. <laughs> Uh, uh, because, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I used to watch movies when I was traveling because in the planes was the place where I was watching movies. Uh, but since I've traveled less, I, I haven't watched many movies. Uh, I would need to have a movie that makes me traveling. Um, there was one, one movie that when I was a kid uh, really inspired me was uh, Lawrence of Arabia, Arabia right? Um, it was a, you know, a movie happening in, you know, in uh, Arabia, and it was uh, just, you know, an inspiration to travels, and I've always been inspired by travels. Uh, and song, um, Pink Floyd, Pink Floyd song, of course. Yeah, I'm 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 fifty I'm fifty four actually just now just past fifty four. So you know when I say Pink Floyd, I realize that you know my kids would say Boomer. Okay. <laughs> you picked the one uh, rock band my uh, my hometown is famous for Cambridge. So. <laughs> ah, very good. I didn't know I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> do you have a Floyd a Floyd song of your that you like the best or just in just in general? Uh, uh, Dark the side world. of the moon. <laughs> the wall. It's the wall. Or, um, uh, Dark side of the moon. Dark side of the moon. Of course, the whole <laughs> the whole album is outstanding. Yes. Yeah. yes, that was my uh, that was my education in music. Was that album? I think when I was about fifteen years old. So I, I'm. We know I actually I <laughs> feel I saw them in concert when I was wow. uh, eighteen. That's also something you did, you you can't forget. There uh, we go. So uh, now we know something about you. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, good. I think so. We've just got a couple of minutes left here, but um, maybe maybe what would be good would be to think a bit about the next few months and into next year. Um, and there's been some questions that have come in on this. Is is what do you expect? most enterprises to do in terms of people back in the office, people working from home. Uh, do you think there'll be a snap back or this is going to be a gradual shift or is something else going to, going to emerge? Uh, we always need to reflect a little bit on the particular situation of every industry. In some industries, the situation will be dramatically different. In some others, you know, you're going to have to go back to the uh, to the factory. Uh, you know, if 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 you're not going to the office every day and to the factory, then you know the plant. Then you know it's nothing will happen. I think, uh, broadly speaking, I would say the uh, business world will will be changed forever. Um, I have seen, you know, obviously that's typically one discussion I'm having with my clients, and a lot of them have come to the realization that they need to propose to their, to their employees uh, a hybrid model. It's never gonna be, you know, you can work from home and I don't want to see you ever, but it's not gonna be easier. You know, you have to be at the office every day, you know, um, whatever, eight to seven or nine to five, whatever. I think it's gonna be a little more flexible, but in my view, Equally important, uh, I strongly believe that offices are not places where you come in the morning to do your job and then you leave. 
it's a place where you come to connect. And that's, I think it's gonna be an evolution, even in the way we are organizing our offices. You're going there because you want to connect with others. You want to meet them. You want to listen to them, learn from them. Uh, if you want to do your emails, you can do it from home. Which by the way, will drive also a certain reduction of the volume of emails and a little more of interactions. Every company is today suffering from the fact that people have been for too long um, separated from each other. And I think it's not healthy. I, I keep hearing people saying, you know, my productivity has not reduced. And I think it's naive, frankly. You certainly can expect that the people are, you know, delivering the, the job they, they, they have to, but they're putting on longer hours. The barriers, the frontiers with their personal life has blurred. And it's not sustainable. So we also need to grow and learn and be more mature in the way we are managing uh, our time or the time of our employees, our colleagues, when they're working from home. But I'm absolutely convinced that we have learned that there's many, many things we can do from distance. And that therefore, what you're looking for when you want to connect with the people physically is a different experience than what we had before. So back to your question, Phil, I would say, we will continue to have offices. Do we need to have as big offices as we had? Maybe not, because not everybody will come to the office every day. But the reason why you, we, we have offices will change. It's not a desk where you come, put your computer, do your email, your phone call, and leave in the evening. It is a place where you need to connect, engage with others. And really, there must be forums for them to uh, build a common experience of this organization and ideate for the future of the organization. Yeah, couldn't agree more with that, um, Thierry. So, uh, uh, and especially around managing time, spending more time uh, personally with this, this blend of business and work, it's, it's, it's becoming a big challenge. And, everybody's dealing with it and this assumption that everyone's available all the time needs to go away right um, but look this has been a most awesome hour conversation uh thanks for all the questions that have come in from the audience uh thanks for giving up an hour of your time for the industry to listen to this uh, Thierry uh, we look forward to having you as well as a panelist at, at our leadership session uh, at our symposium next week too so we look forward to that and um hopefully everyone's got to maybe know you a bit better today. I certainly have and uh, really, really enjoyed hearing your personal views on things as well as your, your vision for your company, Wipro, and, and also the, um, the efforts that Premji, as in Premji, has made uh, with his philanthropic causes. So, so thank you very much. And I think everybody can join me in saying that you had a fantastic hour. Thank you, Phil, and thank you, everyone. Have a great Wonderful. day. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.